This is part two of the required reading from chapter seven. Um, this chapter is on social stratification. In part one, we introduced the concept of social stratification and we discussed three of the four primary social stratification systems, um, the slavery, caste, and estate systems. So in this part of the presentation, we will be discussing the final of the systems, and that is the class system. And as we take a closer look at the class-based stratification system, we will be focusing on what makes this system unique from other systems, um, as well as a discussion of why social stratification is a common characteristic of pretty much all known societies. And then this presentation will end with how do elites in, so in society maintain uh, social stratification. So beginning with that unique characteristic of the class system. So the great thing about living in a class system as opposed to one of the other three is the fact that you have mobility. And so mobility basically means your ability to move around, um, move between those different rungs of the stratification ladder. And so when thinking about mobility, there are kind of three questions that you can kind of ask about the level of mobility that is occurring within a class system. First question you can ask is about the rate of mobility. Um, so how much ability is actually occurring in society and what determines how much ability mobility occurs. And this brings up a concept called structural mobility. And the idea behind structural mobility is that if people want to move up a rung or two, there have to be available positions available to them in order to make that happening. So there has to be room on the rung for you to move up if you want to move up. It doesn't matter how much you would like to or how hard you're willing to work or how much effort you put in. If there is no available position, then you just cannot be within that position. So, you know, even though society is not a zero-sum game, um, there are some jobs, positions that are limited or more limited in number and capacity. Um, and so not everyone can, who would like that job can actually access that job. So medical schools, law schools, pharmacy schools, nursing schools, they turn down people. Um, they turn down applicants every single year who would like um, access to those programs in order to hold one of those positions. Um, and so we call that structural mobility, that there has to be space for you to move into. The other kind of question you can ask about mobility in a society is which one is more common, upward mobility or downward mobility? Because although we talk about mobility like it is necessarily a good thing, it's worth noting that mobility can also mean downward mobility. You can fall down a rung or two on the ladder. Um, if you think about the history of America, we are a country that has experienced um, prolonged periods of time where people have enjoyed upward mobility. Um, we have had two primary time periods where there has been sustained downward mobility. The first of which, of course, was during the 1920s, during the time of the Great Depression. And then, of course, um, at the end of the uh, early aughts, um, when we had our Great Recession. Um, and then, of course, we have periods of just kind of general stagnation. But largely, America, um, when it has sold itself as being a land of opportunity, um, this has been true for a lot of people at different periods of time and even people who had opportunities closed off to them um, largely on the basis of ascribed characteristics such as race or gender. Um, there have been time periods in history where uh, there has been policies and regulations that have pushed to open some of those opportunities up to people regardless of ascribed characteristics. So general trends of upward mobility um, have existed in this society. And the final question that you can kind of ask yourself about mobility deals with range. So how common are rags to riches stories? And I, I give you a, a website there. Um, it's a little dated now, but um, back in the 90s, the New York Times did a piece on social class, and they included this kind of cool calculator that just kind of looks like, you know, where people, the mobility that people experience with the, within even a 10-year time period. Um, 
So when we're talking about range of mobility, uh, there are kind of two different ways we can talk about it. We can talk about it in terms of intergenerational mobility or intragenerational mobility. And I know those sound extremely similar, but what I tell my students um, in my face-to-face -face class is that intragenerational with an A, if you have a pencil, if you have a dog, if you have a, a car, how many do you have? You have one. So intragenerational means what type of mobility have you experienced in your lifetime from your birth to your death? Um, so, you know, were you born in one class and improved your class position by several rungs? Or were you born in a class and perhaps fill several rungs? Um, all of that's intragenerational. Intergenerational is when you compare yourself to maybe your parents or your grandparents or even your great grandparents, right? So how are you doing um, at this age compared to how they were doing at your age? Um, are you doing better? Are you doing worse? Um, so those are just two different ways we can talk about, um, you know, range of mobility over a period of time. Rags to riches stories are generally thought to be intragenerational right and your your book talks specifically about like the Horatio Alger myth right the pull yourself up by your own bootstraps selling the idea that you know you can go from you know a pauper um, to if not a prince um, at least some type of capitalist uh, CEO you know millionaire celebrity um, but if you think about it uh, those types of stories are, are pretty rare um, we see a lot of movement within the middle classes so you can be working class to up middle class you may fall out of the upper middle class to the lower middle class but to truly go from being like in that bottom quintile to the top five percent there aren't a lot of stories like that um, just because all of the systematic kind of hurdles um, and barriers that exists um, for someone that's at the, the, the true bottom of, of the class ladder um, and just because there need to be opportunities, structural mobility, for you to move your way up there. A lot of the more modern stories don't happen in the world of business um, so much as they maybe happen in the world associated with celebrity. So if you have some amazing talents in, in, in the singing uh, or looks slash act or athletics department um, then you might be one of the people in America that can kind of brag of a rags to riches story but for the most part these types of stories are relatively um, relatively uncommon so you know when we speak a social class you know what are we speaking of what are we talking about um, there are several sociological definitions of social class. Your textbook prioritizes the Weber definition, um, which is based on three components, uh, property, power, and prestige, the three P's. So we'll talk about all three of these separately, and then we'll talk about an alternative definition of social class as offered or as imagined by the conflict theorist, particularly Karl Marx. So, you know, for Weber, he saw that these three P's, power, prestige, and property, you know, property being kind of what you own, both your assets and as well as the money that you that comes in, prestige being related to your social status um, to what extent are you held in high esteem in society and power being kind of your ability to exert your will over other people and uh, kind of get them to uh, do what you say um, he was like you know depending on how much of each P you have is how we can kind of characterize you or place you within the social class hierarchy um, and he was like although we might think about people having equally high amounts of all three P's um, what really is the case is that people have more of one than the other um, or they start off having more of one and then use that to get to uh, the to get uh, the other um, or both of the others and you can kind of get a sense of, of how that might would work if you follow along with this chart how somebody um, might can um, use their power like so they have a position of power and from that power position then they develop a, a place of high prestige or they use that power to gain property um, or someone might start with property and um, this is probably maybe the more common thing in our society um, and then they use 
use that that those assets um, in order to then gain a position of power or they use those assets to kind of um, cultivate uh, a level of high esteem or or good reputation associated with their name and same thing with prestige so Weber with his three P's um, offers one conception of, um, of of social class um, before we get to this social stratification is it universal which I guess my slides are in the wrong order um, let me just offer let me just go over Karl Marx's theory of social inequality where he kind of defines uh, social class positions in a different way than Weber did um, so for him um, he kind of split society primarily into two groups there were the capitalists the bourgeoisie the owners um, who owned the means of production which at the time that Karl Marx is writing you want to think about these as like factory owners and then there are the proletariat the workers and these are the people that basically um, they have to work for wage um, they don't own the means of production so they are working for the bourgeoisie and he felt like that the the relationship between these two groups um, what he called class conflict um, was what was going to kind of drive societal development and so what he kind of foresaw happening was that society would change he was like you know for the workers outnumber the um, bourgeoisie um, by large numbers um, and at this time there are very little government regulations on factory work so the work is lowly paid it's dangerous um, you know little children are working in factories um, and you know being injured and misshapen so you know at the time that he is writing um, it, it certainly probably seemed a lot more plausible to him than it does to us now that society perhaps would reach a breaking point point around this issue and for him you know the reason that workers hadn't established what he called true consciousness which was kind of a true awareness of the situation and their placement within the social class hierarchy is because instead um, the dominant class used ideology in order to kind of foster this false consciousness among workers and so basically selling you know the idea um, that um, you know that there's more mobi there's more mobility than what really exists that if you work hard um, under the system that you can you know achieve great things or that your children can achieve great things um, you know that Karl Marx quote that um, religion is the opiate of the masses you know so he also felt like you know it was false consciousness to encourage people to to not necessarily care about their status um, in their in their lives um, uh, as opposed to just kind of caring about like their status um, you know within their kind of religious doctrine you know so after they they die they'll go to heaven so it doesn't matter as much if they're you know struggling um, while alive he considered all of that false consciousness but he felt very optimistic about the fact that at some point society would would kind of reach a breaking point um, and that uh, and that the system would change um, so I will come back to um, I know I'm skipping all over the place but I will come back to this um, what did he think it would change into um, later on in the presentation while I was talking about the definitions of social class or how the theorist kind of saw social class I wanted to go ahead and offer kind of Karl Marx's conception of social class as just kind of a counterpoint to Weber's 3P um, model that for the most part Karl Marx has this much more straightforward model um, largely related to what's your relationship to the means of production now what both Marx and Weber and and as well as just most sociologists uh, agree upon is the idea that social stratification is largely universal um, even if we go back into early time periods of human history like hunting and gathering societies where there was not as much difference um, in the, the level of social inequality wasn't as high it nevertheless still existed um, especially around things like prestige right so we know that even um, anthropological studies tell us that even you know 
early tribes of of of, of humans, um, you know, distinguished but in in terms of power or hierarchy, right? Where some people in the tribe had more power and prestige than others, and usually that might even meant that they owned a little bit more stuff, um, whatever the stuff might might would have been at that time. So it seems like social stratification has always been universal and that's 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 what I said in the last presentation so the question here is why why is it universal so we're gonna talk about kind of two explanations here one of which uh, is the functionalist explanation then the other of which is kind of the conflict explanation um, so the functionalist explanation this is um, the ideas that were put forth by two sociologists, Davis and Moore. They first introduced this theory in 1945, then they scrubbed it up and repackaged it a little um, in 1953. But it's pretty straightforward because they were like, you know, in all societies, in all uh, societies with organic solidarity that have, you know, developed multiple uh, professions and occupations and roles, um, society has to make sure all those positions are filled right um, you know in a perfect society or you know in a society of our dreams maybe we would all be celebrities but then you know who would do our dental work and who would uh, drive uh, the goods that we buy across the country you know who would cook the food that we would like to eat when we go out who would you know teach our children who right you know we we can't have a society where people just have the positions that they want to hold and that was Davis and Moore's point society has to make sure that all positions are filled but that being said some positions are more important than others so you know think about you know what positions in society you feel like are most important that if we did not have this position in society society might really struggle um, to meet its own kind of functional requisites and, and basic needs uh, and that's probably things maybe related to you you know, science and medicine, education, safety and protection, um, all of those jobs um, are, are ones that we might would say are more important. And according to Davis and Moore, those important qu positions need to be filled by the most qualified. So you can't just have necessarily the government assigning like one out of every 200 random people, you know, the role of neurosurgeon. Um, there has to be some type of process in place where you feel pretty confident that only the qualified people um, with the specific abilities and talents, um, skills related to that role, you know, wind up in those positions. And then this is kind of their final point. Um, in order to motivate those people to uh, go after and accept those roles, they probably need to be rewarded. Um, a lot of those important positions, not all of them, but, but maybe a solid number of them, they do involve maybe extended time in school or, or, or very rigorous training. And during that time period, not only are you going through the stress of being in school, but you're missing out on lost wages. So if you think about it, like a doctor can spend easily um, 12 uh, years um, just receiving training if depending on their specialty uh, before they start to make any real money if they made the same exact money as the manager at the Piggly Wiggly then what would motivate people um, to go the doctor out um, according to Davis and Moore very little and we might would wind up in a society where we had doctor shortages so for them he for them their theory was that in order to motivate those people they have to be rewarded um, and so that's that functionalist explanation of inequality but as your book notes that doesn't mean there aren't any critiques that one could make um, about this theory um, so the critique of Davis and Moore which was offered by a sociologist by the last name of Tuman um, your book goes through a lot of detail uh, about like several points of, of that critique I'm gonna highlight two of those points here in this presentation first of all Tuman pushes back about this idea about which 
uh, positions are most important because he notes that the actual difference in rewards between positions is not necessarily a measure of their relative worth to society. So meaning if you looked at how we compensated people in this society and used that as a way to evaluate how important their role in society might be, you know, we don't always compensate people um, in a way that is in concordance with their value. A good example of this is teachers, especially in a state like North Carolina, where usually um, the teacher pay is ranked like 46, 47 out of the 50 states. So we, the state doesn't offer very good compensation to its teachers, but nobody argues about how important the role of a teacher might would be. Um, but their level of rewards don't suggest that they're that important. And that is is a, a flaw um, of the Davis and Moore theory is that there are plenty of jobs where they are paid a lot more than what their level of importance in society would suggest. And the example that I offer is the oftentimes high six, low seven um, figure uh, salary associated with hedge, with hedge fund managers. Um, who are able to make so much money because their clientele are the five, top five, top 10% who can afford to compensate them graciously uh, for their expertise. Um, but it raises the question that if your clientele is such a small segment of society, you know, how much value do you really have to overall society? For most of us who will never employ a hedge fund manager, would we really notice if they would missing um, but yet if you looked at their compensation level it would seem that they would be a lot more important than than even doctors um, in our society so this idea that the more important positions are those that are most highly rewarded um, it the evidence doesn't really perfectly suggest that that is the case the other issue and for people that are interested in educational inequities, um, issues with educational access, is that, you know, how do we know that the most qualified people are getting these jobs? The stratification um, explanation that Davis and Moore offer rests on the idea of meritocracy, that the qualified people are the people that are getting the jobs and therefore are people who more or less deserve to be highly compensated and rewarded. But what we know is there's often times there are a lot of things that may limit discovery of talent. Um, those who are born to privilege are given more opportunities and avenues to realize their occupational success. Um, they have better connections. They go to better schools. Um, they have access to top internships. That doesn't mean that there aren't potentially extremely talented, just as worthy for those positions, people in the uh, lower middle class, working class, working poor class, poor class. Um, it means that it is a lot harder for us to discover those talents. Um, it's not a caste system, so it's not impossible, but it is, uh, there are some limitations there. Um, and so that is a flaw in the system if instead of really getting the best qualified people um, to have these highly compensated jobs, we're getting people that are qualified but really are just kind of in addition to being qualified, are just kind of already well placed. Um, so they may not be the most qualified, but they are just well positioned because of their current socioeconomic status um, to gain access to these jobs. And so this is why, for that reason, the conflict perspective on why social stratification is universal is that, you know, once people have power, they work to maintain power. So it says that they create economic, political, and social conditions that favor them and their children. Um, and that's true, uh, even if sometimes those conditions are detrimental to the lower classes or exploitative. And this if we this is something that um, the conflict perspective um, comes up quite a bit when you're talking about things like, for instance, education, um, as well as in terms of work, um, who gets hired by what companies and who gets promoted, and uh, especially into kind of upper level management positions or CEO positions. Um, 
every time the Fortune uh, 400, uh, that list by Forbes comes out, you know, people will kind of go through and they'll always know that, you know, there are less and less people there that don't have education and not just that but the bulk of people who are there got got their education if not their bachelor's at least their advanced degrees from just a handful of top tier schools whether they're top tier privates or top tier the top the, the top tier of state schools um you know and and conflict theorists would just suggest that doesn't mean that there aren't other people in society who would not be able to do those jobs, who would not have the skills and abilities to do those jobs. It's just we lost out on that discovery of talent. Um, and the reason we lost out on it is because society isn't necessarily set up for people to easily move from the bottom rungs to the top rungs, um, as easy as they might would be able to move from the you know, second from the top rung uh, to the top rung. And so that's the conflict theorist idea. And that focus on exploitation is in keeping with the fact that, of course, the conflict theorist, the primary conflict theorist, of course, is Karl Marx, who, as I already explained, he thought class conflict was going to kind of be the main driver of human society, um, that it was that class conflict would boil over at some point and that... Um, society would change. And so he pretty much kind of uh, in his writings, he predicted that at some point there would be a revolution where workers would rise up against the capitalists and the people um, kind of aligned with the capitalists and they would overthrow that system. So they would overthrow capitalism. And he thought it would be replaced by what he called a more advanced system. Um, which for him, that more advanced system is actually a two-step process. Because when you think about what we associate with Karl Marx, we associate, of course, communism. Um, but in his writings, he did not think that society was going to go from a capitalist society straight to a communist one. Instead, he thought that once capitalism was overthrown, it would be replaced by socialism. And in socialism, the government owns the means of production. Um, and instead of the focus being on profit, the focus is supposed to be on the collective good, and the government largely divvies out out, um, divvies out compensation, goods and services in such a way that inequality is supposedly uh, diminished. And of course, we know that, you know, this isn't necessarily true. We've seen how socialism has played out in, in, in other countries. Um, and while it does do an admirable job of preventing people from falling too far down the class ladder, it also limits the ability for people to kind of move up the class ladder. Um, so it, it, the, the floor is not as low as it is in capitalism, but the ceiling is not as high. Um, and that creates creates problems related to uh, motivation and work efficiency um, and meritocracy and, and you know, uh, just kind of individual merit um, issues as well. But of course, Karl Marx did not know that at the time because largely um, there was no system like that in place at the time he was writing. So he, he foresaw that capitalism would be replaced by socialism and there would be a long period of time where the government would own the means of production. But at some point he thought that the government and this is exactly how he wrote it that it would wither away and at that point people because they would have been conditioned on how to live as a collective and largely share equally would enjoy what he called communism um, which the emphasis there word there is on commune com communality um, right so the idea that we all share and share alike now this is where it gets tricky um, because communism, Marxist communism, has literally been practiced by pretty much no country. Um, and we know this because of what he said needed to happen in order to predate communism is that the government needed to wither away. Countries that have practiced their version of what they call communism um, 
usually not only did not have, you know, not only did they have governments, they oftentimes had the types of governments that we refer to as authoritarian governments or even totalitarian governments, um, where the government had a lot of uh, control over all aspects of an individual's life. Um, so outside of like some communes, some small scale type of communes that have existed in places on a large scale, um, whether you're talking China, whether you're talking Cuba, whether you're talking North Korea, um, commun whether you're talking about, you know, the USSR during its heyday, none of that was really communism as it was initially imagined as a philosophy. Um, it was instead some type of hybrid of socialism and total and totalitarianism. Um, and since totalitarianism never sounds good, it doesn't doesn't even roll off the tongue easily. Um, certainly, for labeling and packaging and marketing purposes, um, it's a lot easier to sell what those countries did uh, to citizens, uh, to its citizens, as communism. Um, but certainly, Marx would not agree. Um, I give you a link here to watch a cartoon um, if if you uh, would like um, and of course in your module I also gave you a link to a an explanation video um, that will offer more detail about kind of Karl Marx's theory around uh, social inequality and so this is just the helpful chart from your book as a way to kind of um, compare and contrast those uh, two differing views on why we have stratification, how do different people fare um, under in these stratified societies, you know, the, the functionalist view of this and the conflict view of this. Um, and certainly uh, the conflict view of stratification heavily emphasizes the role that elites play in maintaining the stratification. And so they make the point in your textbook, and this is roughly where you can stop reading because after this it becomes a lot about global stratification, um, which um, I am not requiring um, for this class. Uh, they talk about the fact that um, elites maintain stratification in most countries now through soft control versus force. Um, and that's because when governments use force to maintain control, um, this uh, lowers morale, um, it increases resentment towards the government. And in a global society, right, where we have the mass media and, you know, we have all these internet, you know, it also makes the country look bad um, to its peers. So if you think about like maybe what, what we're witnessing now with Hong Kong, right, when the government uses force against its citizens, um, it certainly diminishes that country um, kind of in the eyes of its other countries. And so, you know, at this point, more sophisticated countries, if you want to maintain stratification, it's just a better idea to go with the soft control versus the force. And so, you know, your book goes over several ways in which you they, that a country can use soft control. Um, you know, you control ideas, you can control information, uh, you can stifle criticism in a variety of ways. Um, you know, big brother technology allows you to kind of keep an eye on your citizens, especially maybe if they're doing things um, that you feel like go against government interests. Um, but all of these things is what allows um, social stratification to remain um, kind of a universal characteristic across all societies. And that is it for chapter seven. Um, so I will be posting uh, three parts uh, presentation to cover the material uh, from chapter eight where we will focus um, a lot more on um, social class itself not necessarily the class stratification system